Why? Major reason why. They don't have it well designed. They've left the design of their future to somebody else. And if you don't make plans of your own, guess what? You'll probably fall into someone else's plans. Guess what someone else may have planned for you? Not much. You got to make a list of this not much stuff. I'm telling you, people all their lives count on this not much list. If all of your negative relatives all turn positive, what will that do for your future? Not much. If prices come down a little, what will that do for your future? Not much. If the economy gets a little better, what will that do for your future? Not much. If circumstances get a little better, what will that do? Not much. If the weather gets a little better over the next few years, that'll do. Not much. I mean, you could go right down this whole scenario list. Most people all their lives with their fingers crossed count on this not much list. That's why 10 years from now, they'll be driving what they don't want to drive, living where they don't want to live, wearing what they don't want to wear, doing what they don't want to do, having what they don't want to have, maybe become what they didn't want to become. And it all starts by counting on something that's not going to count much. You say, well, then how can my life dramatically change? You got to count on yourself. And here's one of the things you've got to count on, your ability to design the future. It's called the promise. And the promise of the future, if you'll design it well, can have an awesome effect on your life. But if you face the future with apprehension, you'll take hesitant steps all day, uncertain steps all day. And if you take uncertain steps all day for six years, you can imagine how empty your life can be. We've got to help our kids with the promise of the future. Now, here's what's connected to the promise, the price, the price to pay. But I'm telling you, the price is easy if the promise is clear. One of the better notes to make for today. The price is easy if the promise is clear and powerful. But the price seems almost too much to pay, too much to get over, too much to accomplish if the promise isn't clear, if the promise isn't powerful. I'm telling you, kids will pay the disciplines if they can see the promise. One of our biggest challenges as parents in the 90s is to help our kids see the promise of the future. That's why I'm teaching financial independence, how to become wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and unique. All of the stuff kids would hope to go for. It's all possible. This is America. That's the promise of the future. The price, a few simple disciplines practiced every day. And I'm telling you, the kids will pay the price of the simple disciplines if they can see the promise of the future. But if they can't see, they don't want to pay. And the same is true of all of us. We will pay the most extraordinary disciplines if we can see the promise of the future called setting goals. So I'm asking you to get a handle on the future. I'm asking you not to leave it to anyone else. Not, don't leave it to the company. Companies got their own goals. I'm asking you to set your own goals, your personal goals. Income goals and financial goals and health goals and spiritual goals. And where do you want to go and what do you want to do and what do you want to see and what do you want to be? That's it. Promise of the future. Design your own future. It's within your hands and your capacity to do so. Here's how simple now goal setting is. It's not mysterious. You don't have to anchor, you don't have to focus, you don't have to visualize, none of that stuff. Here's how simple goal setting is, change my life. Decide what you want and write it down. I mean, that's how profound this stuff is. Decide what you want and write it down, make a list. Where do you wanna go? What do you wanna do? What do you wanna see? What do you wanna be? What do you wanna have? What do you wanna share? What projects would you like to support? What would you like to be known for? What skills would you like to learn? Some extraordinary things you'd like to do, ordinary things you'd like to do, right? Silly little things you'd like to do, very important things you'd like to do. Decide, decide on all that stuff and write it down, write it down, write it down. That's how simple this stuff is. And it's your own private list. If it's really private, you know, on your list, put some stuff in code where nobody can understand it if this list <laughs> fell into unfriendly hands. Okay. And simple things, whatever. Foolish things, doesn't matter, it's your list. I had a little revenge on my first list. Budget finance, who used to harass me. I got two or three payments behind this one guy called incessantly. Said, we're gonna come get your car, drag it rear end up down the street in front of your neighbors. 
put me down something fierce. When I met Shof, got my life straightened out, one of the first things on one of my lists was budget finance. <laughs> and when I finally got the money, I needed a little drama in my life. Finally got the money to pay them off. I put it in small bills in a big briefcase. <laughs> Walked into the budget finance office on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. The guy who harassed me so often, his desk was about three back. I opened the door, walked in right up to his desk, stood right in front of him, never said a word. He said, well, what are you doing here? Didn't say a word. I opened up this briefcase, dumped this pile of money all over his desk. I said, count it. It's all there. I'll never be back. Turned around, walked out, slammed the door. Now that might be, not be noble, but you got to try it at least one time. <laughs> Pay off with a little drama. Got to check them off my list. Keep your list with you. I keep my list in my journal so that I can go back. Five years ago, here was my list. And I'm a little embarrassed. Here's what I thought was so important now. How my philosophy has changed from 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. Here's my old list. Here's my new list. Here's what's valuable to me now. Here's what I want my life to be now. Here's where I want to go, what I want to do, what I want to see. Keep your lists of goals so that it shows your growth, shows your ability to change and grow. Your philosophy grows and expands what's valuable. Setting goals. It doesn't matter how small, foolish it is. Put it on your list. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. Good morning. I thought that was good. I like that. <laughs> Have you got this profound thing now on setting goals? Here's how profound it is. Decide what you want and write it down. Get together with your wife, decide. Get together with your kids, decide. Get together with your business colleagues, decide. Write it down, make a list. Okay, that's how easy it is. Now let me give you one more scenario on setting goals. When I started making my first list, Mr. Shove said, Mr. Owen, looks like we're gonna be together for a while. He said, I've got a suggestion for you. He said, I think one of the first goals you ought to set, you're 25 year old American male, sure you've made some mistakes, but now you're on the road to better things. You got a family, worth it. Reasons makes the difference. And he said, you've got every reason to do this. He said, why don't you, among all the goals you're gonna set, said, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? A millionaire, this is America. All the possibilities are available. Why don't you set a goal eh? to become a millionaire? He said, it's got a nice ring to it. <laughs> millionaire. Enough zeros to impress your accountant. Millionaire. And he said, here's why. Now I thought, the man doesn't need to teach me why. I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a million dollars? He said, no, that's not it. Here's why. And I had one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, and I'm about to share it with you. This will be worth the price of being here today if you can capture what I'm about to share with you. Babysitter fees, whatever else you pay. Some of you missed some sales today to be here, so this is a costly day for you. But what I'm about to share with you changed my whole life. Here's what Mr. Shove said. Set a goal to become a millionaire. And he said, here's why. For what it will make of you to achieve it. And I got one of the greatest classes in one sentence I've ever received in my life. Set a goal that'll make you stretch that far for what it will make of you to achieve it. What a brand new reason for setting goals. What an all-encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future. What for? To see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why. The greatest value in life is not what you get. The greatest value in life is what you become. Major question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting here? That's not the major question. The major question to ask is, what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become that makes you valuable. So Shove said, set a goal to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it. Then he said, when you finally have become a millionaire, 
Now, he said, what's important is not the money. I thought, wow, I've got some more to learn. <laughs> he said, no, no, Mr. Ron, I'm telling you honestly, you could just give the money away. Now, I did better than that, right? I told you. I lost it all. <laughs> I'm rich by the time I'm 31. I'm a millionaire. I'm broke by the time I'm 33. So I didn't have to give it all away. I lost it all. <laughs> Foolish mistakes I made. That I'm a farm boy from Idaho. That early money drove me bonkers. I used to say, how many colors does it come in? I'll buy them all. I just went, I went crazy over that first money. I just went crazy. And then I made that one foolish mistake, right? Continuing guarantee. I mean, you know, I'm so naive off the farm. I don't know what continuing means. And a few other mistakes. And by the time I'm 33, I'm broke. Now I've made and lost millions since then. But what an experience that was. And I'm telling you, the man was right. When I finally was broke at age 33, guess what I discovered? My money did not mean that much. It represented only a fraction of all my assets. Shove said, once you become a millionaire, Mr. Rohn, you can give all the money away. Because he says, what's important is not the money. What's important is the person you've become. Now, give me the, let me give you the key phrase on setting goals. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Always keep that in mind. What will this make of me? If I set this goal and go for it, not only will I achieve it, but what will it make of me in the process? What a whole new concept on setting goals. Now, there's two parts to this, and then we're wrapping up goals. Here's the first part now on this goal setting for what you become. Number one, don't set your goals too low. Interesting, we teach in leadership. You'll find it on the cassettes. Don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure's on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop, to read, to study, to develop skills. I belong to a small group. We do business around the world. You cannot believe the expectations at that level. What we expect of each other in terms of excellence, far beyond average. Why? so that we can each grow, so that we can receive from the group, we can contribute to the group, something unprecedented. It's called living at the summit. Go where the demands are high. Go where the expectations are strong so that it'll provoke you, push you urgently, insist that you not remain the same for the next couple of years, the next five years, that you'll grow and change. So don't set your goals too low. The guy says, well, I don't need much. Well, then you don't need to become much. <laughs> now, here's the last part on setting goals. Don't compromise. Don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early years that I paid too big a price for. If I'd have known how much it was going to cost me, I never would have paid, but I didn't know. Don't sell out. Ancient phrase says, count the cost, count the cost, count the cost. An ancient story says, Judas got the money. You say, well, that's a success story. No, no. <laughs> it's true, 30 pieces of silver in those days was a sizable fortune. You say, well, if a guy's got a fortune, right, that's a success story. No, you don't understand. His name was Judas. Doesn't that ring a bell? Judas you say oh yes Judas Judas the traitor that's right the traitor got the money doesn't that change the story and the answer is of course it changes the story interestingly enough after Judas gets the money from becoming a traitor he's got the money in his hot little hand and now he's unhappy somebody says well if you had a fortune how could you be unhappy well he wasn't unhappy with the money he was unhappy with himself Key phrase, the greatest source of unhappiness is self-unhappiness. The greatest source of unhappiness doesn't come from outside. The greatest source of unhappiness comes from inside. 
And here's where the erosion starts, doing a little less than you could. That's where the beginning little infection of unhappiness starts, doing a little less than you can, not feeling that good about yourself. So don't let that happen. Judas is unhappy. He says, what will I do? He says, oh, I'll just take the money back. Walked in where he got the money and said, here, take this money. I'm unhappy. They said, heck with you, Judas. We got what we wanted. You got what you wanted out. They threw him out with his money. Judas says, well, what will I do now? He says, oh, clever. Should have thought of this first. I'll just throw the money away. And he proceeded to throw his fortune away. Why would he throw his fortune away? He was so unhappy with himself. And that's not even the end of the scenario. After he threw his fortune away, he couldn't change what he became, a traitor. And now in total abject frustration, he goes out and hangs his worthless self, which all traitors should do, save the state the money. <laughs> Why such a tragic end? Because he was so unhappy with himself. He sold out. He sold out. He paid too big a price. Ancient script sums it all up and said, what if you gained the whole world and it cost you your soul too big a price to pay if you got the whole world? Don't sell out. Don't compromise your values. Don't compromise your virtues. Don't compromise your philosophy. Key. Here's the key word, beware. If Judas could speak back, he'd probably say beware. Two good words from ancient script. One, behold, the positive word. Behold the possibilities, behold the opportunity. Behold the drama, behold the awesomeness, behold the uniqueness. Behold the majesty, behold, behold. What a good word. But here's the other word. Beware, beware, beware. Don't sell out. Mark well what you become in pursuit of what you want. But I'm inspiring you, hopefully, to set the kind of goals that will transform your life, make you far better than you are, far stronger than you are. Okay. Isn't this good advice? This is such good stuff. I should have paid to get in, right? <laughs> Fabulous. What should a child do with a dollar? Let me give you the best advice I've got. And this is called sort of middle of the road scenario. And I'll show you how these numbers may change. But here's what I teach. Kids never spend more than 70 cents. Now you gotta pick some number. When I met Mr. Shoaff, I was at about 110%. But remember this, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. Good little scenario. So here's the number that I found works best in, in developing a good financial plan. Never spend more than 70 cents out of every dollar from now on. Now kids ask me what? What do you do with the other 30 cents? Here's my best advice. 10 cents, charity. 10% charity, supporting worthy projects, helping people who cannot help themselves. Some churches teach tithe, peace, portion, turning back part of what you take out. Excellent, excellent philosophy. That's what that 10% is. And nothing teaches children responsibility and character better than generosity. No school, no class, no teacher can teach character better than the simple act of generosity, 10 cents out of every dollar. Now you can pick your own number. I'm just giving you my best scenario. Now the time to start this is when the amounts are small. Easy to give a dime out of a dollar. I'm telling you, kids will give you 10 cents out of every dollar if it's part of their philosophy, if you sell them on it. And that's the time to start when it's easy, 10 cents out of a dollar. A little harder to give 100,000 out of a million. Someone says, oh, if I had a million dollars, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not that sure. 
we better start you early when the amounts are small so it'll all be set in when the big amounts start to come, okay? So 10 cents for charity. The next 10 cents I call active capital. Capital meaning, meaning try to make a profit yourself. We live in a capitalistic society, right? Everybody now wants to join capitalism. That's why the walls are coming down. Capital belongs in the hands of the people. That's where the genius is. So the genius is to try to show a profit. Buy and sell. Render service. Show a profit. Now here's what I teach kids. Profits are better than wages. Wages are okay. But wages help you make a living. Profits help you make a fortune. The key is to just understand philosophically a little simple economic scenario. And there's all kinds of ways to make a profit. I'm working on a new book. Here's what it's called. I think it's going to be called. Of course, kids should pay taxes. It's going to be an interesting book. In California, where I live, kids do pay taxes. If an eight-year-old walks into 7-Eleven, buys something that costs a dollar, the proprietor makes him cough up seven more pennies. Eight-year-old says, what's these seven pennies? Proprietor says, that taxes. That's taxes. Kid says, well, I'm only eight. Proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. <laughs> so in California, kids do pay taxes. Now the question is, should they? Now the title of my book is, of course, kids should pay taxes. You got it, right? The disciple went and caught a fish, found the miracle coins and paid his taxes and Jesus' taxes. So way back then, Jesus did pay taxes. Now the question is, should he? And the answer in my little book says, of course, Jesus and kids should pay taxes. Of course, of course. If an eight-year-old wants to ride his bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you have to pay taxes. Things cost money. You've got to pay taxes. <coughs> Aircraft carriers keep tyranny over there instead of over here. Aircraft carriers cost money. It's expensive to run this whole show. You can't use used missiles. I mean, you know, it's expensive to run the whole deal. <laughs> of course, everybody has to pay. Now. Active capital means try your best to show a profit. Now, there's many ways to show a profit, not just money. Touch something, leave it better than you found it. That's a profit. Some profits are intangible. Some profits are tangible. Long before Earth Day, for all sophisticated people, it was very proper when you left your hotel room to turn out the lights. All educated people. Why? Leave a profit. It's so easy to flip the switch and leave a profit. Some says, well, the hotel gets the profit. What do you care? All you need to become is a person who leaves a profit. Wow. I talked to a man who runs a whole string of apartments. He said, guess what? Most people, when they rent an apartment, leave it, what? Trashed, worse than they found it. What kind of a reputation would that be? Whatever you touch turns to trash. Whatever you touch gets dirty. Nothing you touch gets better. See, that's a poor philosophy. No wonder it leads to poverty, small lives. As one writer said, living lives of quiet desperation. This is where it all begins. Failure to leave a profit when you can, turn out the lights, doesn't matter what it is. Become profit-minded. Profits are better than wages. Because profit has the potential to make a fortune. Wages has the potential to make a living. So I teach kids, take part of your wages. If you earn the money, take part of it for charity and part of it to see if you can't make a profit. And there's all kinds of ways. My book's going to be full of all kinds of ways kids can make money. I teach kids how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. I mean, you know, it doesn't take long to get into business. You don't have to be a genius. Halfway bright, you can start showing a profit. Now, here's the next 10 cents called passive capital. Meaning, let somebody else use the capital, you provide it, you're passive, they're active. And let them pay you interest. Profits and interest. Unique way to make a fortune. 
In fact, there's a Bible philosophy. I teach teenagers this Bible philosophy. Here's what it teaches. The borrower is servant to the lender. Wow. So where is the power position? Not a spender, a lender. And if I've taught teenagers well, if you ask them among some of the things you want to be, you know, when you grow up, you know, as years pile on, what would you like to be? I'm telling you among some of the things that they would like to be, if they've sat in on my classes or gotten some of my material, they were say, I want to be one of them lenders. Powerful position. Let somebody else use your capital. Some projects require more capital than any one person has. So we've got capital pools, whether you put it in a financial institution or whatever, right? Earn an interest, earn a profit, right? Buy a car and sell it for more than you paid for it. Why? Because you leave it better than you found it. Touch something and leave a profit. Okay, it's not just wrapped up in money and economics. This helps to teach all other scenarios of life on profit and capital and expenditures, what to do with your time and what to do with your life and as well as what to do with your money. Okay, now this little scenario I call the ideal. Now here's what's important, to set up the ideal and work toward it. Because at first you may not be able to do these numbers. Some people are in such a desperate situation currently, they got to go 97, 1, 1, and 1. I mean, you know, the, I had to start there. Start with pennies. And remember, it's not the amount that counts. Mr. Shof gave me the clear situation. Here it is. It's not the amount that counts. It's the plan that counts. When I met Mr. Shof, I'm 25 years old. I said to him, if I had more money, I'd have a better plan. He said, no, Mr. Rohn, if you had a better plan, you'd have more money. Six years? Six years? In America, six years? Come on. It's not the money. It's not the amount. It's the plan that counts. So set up an ideal plan like this. Now, you can rearrange this and modify it to suit yourself. I'm just giving you here as an example. So set up the ideal and then start making progress toward it. Okay. Because finally, these numbers are going to change if you move on up into the higher area, right? The people I work with around the world couldn't spend 70 cents out of every dollar. It would be obscene. That would be too much. So these numbers are bound to change. I don't know what mine are, probably 20% up here. A lot larger numbers down here, okay? So these numbers can change. I'm just offering you a good sample philosophy. Remember, philosophy is the set of the sail. The economy is not the set of the sail for you. For you, the set of the sail is your own philosophy, your own thinking, your own plan, your own concept. Don't borrow somebody else's plan. Don't borrow somebody else's concept. Don't borrow the concept, you know, spend all you can, cross your fingers and hope for the best. Don't borrow that. Develop your own philosophy, and I'm telling you, it'll lead you to unique places. Now, the rest of a lot of this is on the cassette tapes, but let me just give you two or three more pieces of the scenario here. Then I want to talk about communications, and then we're going to wrap it up. Okay. Here's two or three more parts to financial independence. Number one, keep strict accounts. This is the best of disciplines. Keep strict accounts. Did you ever hear this expression? I don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear that? I don't know where it all goes. Oh, we'd love to have you run our company. You don't know where it all goes. Whoa. Did you ever hear this? It just gets away from me. It just seems it just gets away from me. Oh, we'd love to turn the world over you. It just gets away from you. Come on, you gotta have better disciplines than that. Let that be the 90%. Let that be the scenario of the 97%, but don't let it be your scenario. Don't let it become your philosophy. Keep strict accounts. Next, a new attitude. I had to develop a new attitude as well as new concepts. Here's what I used to say. I hate to pay my taxes. Shof said, well, that's one way to live. I thought, well, doesn't everybody hate to pay their taxes? He said, no. No, a few of us have gotten way past that. 
He says, once you understand what taxes are, here's what taxes are in our governmental system in our society. Taxes is how you care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. Democracy and liberty and freedom, free enterprise. Wouldn't you want to feed the goose that lays the golden eggs? Somebody says, well, the goose eats too much. That's probably true. I understand that. Of course that's true. But see, better a fat goose than no goose. And here's the truth be known. We all eat too much. Let not one appetite accuse another. Of course the government needs to go on a diet. So do most of us. But hey, you still have to care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs once you understand that that's what it's for. See, it is so important, the right attitude. Here's what I used to say. I hate to pay my bills. You open up the mails, nothing but these window envelopes. Bills, I hate to pay my bills. Shelf said, well, that's one way to live. I said, well, doesn't everybody hate to pay their bills? He said, no, some of us are way beyond that. I said, is it possible to love to pay your bills? He said, yes. Reduce your liabilities, increase your assets. Wouldn't you love to do that? So start a whole new attitude here. Next time you pay $100 on an account, put a little note in there and say, with great delight, I send you this $100. <laughs> I mean, they don't get many letters like that. Reduce my liabilities, increase my assets. My picture's changing, my picture's improving. I love to pay my bills. Keep the money in circulation. Pay my taxes, feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's a matter of attitude. And here's the last on attitude. Everybody must pay. Of course, life is called opportunity, but life is called price. But we must all pay. We must all share. One of the classic stories of all time from ancient Bible script says, Jesus one day and his disciples were standing by the church treasury, synagogue treasury, watching people as they came by and put their offering in the treasury. That wouldn't be a bad idea, Jesus and his disciples standing by the treasury while everybody walks by. Jesus says, how much was that? Interesting. And the story said some people came by, put in big amounts. Some people came by, put in modest amounts, average amounts. And the story says, then a little lady comes by and puts in two pennies in the treasury. Jesus says to his disciples, look at that. Look at that. His disciples said, two pennies, two pennies. What's two pennies? Jesus said, no, you don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said, two pennies is more than everybody else? He said, yes. Because I'm certain that her two pennies represented most of what she had. And if you give most of what you have, then you've given the most. What a lesson to learn. It's not the amount. 